Okie dokie. So, I am going to give my presentation in English, unfortunately, so this might be a good time to get a bathroom break or something like that. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about bacteria. First, though, we're going to plan a space mission. So let's pretend for a couple of minutes that we are in charge of setting up a colony on another planet, like Mars. What sorts of things would we be looking for when we were picking our colony site, for starters? You have like 10 seconds to shoot something out, because I've only got 10 minutes for this presentation. Water. That's excellent, because that's the first one. Awesome sauce. OK. Uh, anyone got another one? Uh, that, yeah, I kind of got that in there. So I got, I got raw materials, and I also got like food, or at least like good soil so that we can grow some food. So you guys kind of got all of them. That was pretty good. And what kinds of equipment would we need to take with us when we were setting up our colony site? I'm just going to tell you. Temporary structures so that we can be safe while we're actually starting our colony. Those are some things we might want to think about. Now, as humans, we don't have to think about this stuff because we're all safe and happy. But bacteria actually do. Many bacteria live lives similar to little space explorers, swimming around searching for everything they need to survive. And they're searching for a lot of the same stuff that you would be looking for if you were setting up a colony, like we just talked about. So it should come as no surprise that they employ very similar strategies to the ones that we do to survive. And one of their favorite strategies is to work together. So while we have cities like Trieste, Italy, to help us, I went on vacation there with my family a few months ago to escape our lovely Hamburg winter, um, they use biofilms. Now, a biofilm is formed when a bunch of microorganisms, like bacteria, but fungi do this as well, work together to actually build three-dimensional structures, like a city, that protect them, but also allow them to exploit resources from their environment, like their mining or something. They can help each other out, essentially. And the steps that they take, and one of my favorite places, sorry, to find biofilms is here. So this is a lake near where I grew up, and I was like 13 when this picture was taken, and back then I thought wearing my hat to the side like that made me look super cool and kind of like a gangster, and I could not have been more wrong. But if you've ever been to a place like this, or for instance, if you've gone wading out into the Elba, you know that you might have to be a little bit careful because all of those rocks at the bottom of the river are very slippery. That's because they're covered in biofilms. Another place that you can find biofilms is here. That's the drain of my sink. It's a much less fun biofilm, but you've probably seen this one before. Biofilms are all around us, and the steps that bacteria take to form them are actually quite similar to the ones that we would use when setting up a colony. So they start as just free swimming explorers, searching around for everything that they need to survive. And when they find a site that they think they might like, they'll land and do what's called reversible attachment, where they basically will investigate and search around, see if there's food, water, all those things we talked about. And if they do find things that they like, they'll move on to colony formation, which will be like those temporary structures that we talked about. This eventually culminates in a mature biofilm, which is a lot like a city, as I said before. This biofilm can then be dispersed in an orderly fashion if there's a major predation event or if they run out of food. Now, all of the steps in this process have been studied, but all of my projects focus specifically on this step here. This is called the reversible attachment step, as I said before. And it is one of the most dynamic times in a young bacterium's life because she has to make a huge decision. If she commits to forming a biofilm, it's a massive input of resources, and she has to undergo major physiological changes so that she can do all of the things she needs to do to build and live her life there. So it should come as no surprise that she employs a very special system to actually make this happen. In Pseudomonas fluorescens, where I study it, this is known as the lab system. So to talk about the lab system, I'm going to start with the little molecular machine, also known as a protein, for which it is named, which is LAP-A. LAP-A stands for Large Adhesion Protein A, and you'll understand why in a minute. Scientists are not very interesting when they choose to name things. And this protein basically functions as a tether. So bacteria, as I said before, are kind of like astronauts. They're always floating around. They can't really stay in one place very long without some extra effort. What does an astronaut do when he's on the outside of the International Space Station and he has to stay in one place for a while? He uses a tether. Bacteria do the exact same thing. Lap A functions as their tether. 
It even has this cool adhesion domain on the end that allows them to stick to a surface, a little bit like a carabiner. The other cool feature about lap A is what's known as the retention domain. And that is kind of like a knot at the end of a rope. So you can kind of see in this picture here that rope is threaded through that metal fastening but doesn't go all the way through because of that bulky knot on the end. Lap A functions exactly the same way. Now when I was looking for a picture online of something to help you visualize this, the only good one that I could find was this picture, which I found on a website called stairropes.com. So if this is intriguing to you and you want one in your house, this is the website for you. <laughs> now, lap A presents a problem for the bacterium because this is reversible attachment. They have to leave. So one of the things that they do to deal with this is they use the protein lap G. This is what lap G looks like. But even though it looks complicated in this picture, it's just a fancy pair of scissors. The bacteria do the simplest possible thing. They cut the knot off the end of the rope, and then, of course, the rope threads all the way through, the knot stays on the inside of the bacterium, and the bacterium is free to float away. But lap G presents another problem, one which, in 2014, astronaut Karen Nyberg actually also had to solve. So Karen is an astronaut, as I said, and in 2014, she was serving on the International Space Station, but she was also competing in an international quilting festival. And she completed her quilt square during her time on the space station. Now, the inside of a space station is a lot like the inside of a bacterium. Everything is floating around. You're sensing a theme, probably, at this point. Now, Karen, in order to deal with this, came, with, came up with a really special strategy. So she knew you couldn't just put something down and expect it to stay there. And in particular, her scissors could get into all sorts of trouble if they're just floating in the space station. So what did she do? She used this special Velcro pad to keep her scissors exactly where she wanted them until she needed them. In the lap system, lap D functions as a sophisticated piece of Velcro. Now this is the picture I typically use when talking about lap D, but it's a little too complicated for a 10 minute talk, so I simplified. Here are some of the key features of lap D. It has this cute little arm right here, which I'll show you more about in a minute, and this little binding domain is what it's called at the bottom here. So when lap D is actually inside of the bacteria, it never looks like this. It always pairs up with a buddy to form what's called a dimer. And when it looks like this, it's inactive, meaning that lap G is free to float around, that's our scissors, just cutting stuff right and left. But when it's activated, it looks like this. So four copies of lap D actually come together. Two dimers reach out their arms and link up so that they can hold on to two copies of lap G. Now this is all turned on by the molecule cyclic DIGMP, which binds those little arms. Now cyclic DIGMP is a really important molecule for bacteria because it is the master switch for biofilm formation. So it turns on everything from the processes that, the, that are required for them to build those scaffolds or those cities to extra virulence factors in case they need to kill other bacteria in the area to this system right here. And this is one of the first systems that they turn on. So this is a very important molecule for these bacteria. So, that is the lap system, but let's put it all together. Say you're a young bacterium, you're floating around, you've just found the perfect place to live, but you need to make sure. So you land, and you start producing a ton of cyclic DIGMP. This activates your lap system, which allows your special Velcro, lap D, to hold on to your scissors, lap G, and keep them from cleaving lap A, which is your large, sticky protein. Now, you've investigated the site and you hate it, so what do you do? All you have to do to leave is get rid of the cyclic DIGMP that you already made and stop making new cyclic DIGMP, which will allow you to turn off lap D so that lap G can be free to cleave the end off of lap A and you will be released from the surface. PhDs in the United States take five years and this is part of the reason why, is to keep all the laps straight. Now, I wanna spend a minute just at the end to talk about why you should care about this system and to do that, I'm gonna show you my sink again. Now, I have been dealing with this biofilm for like two years since I moved into this flat. It won't go anywhere. It doesn't matter how much drain cleaner I use, it just won't come out. And the reason for that is because it's reached this stage, this mature biofilm step. They have so many layers of scaffolding and bacteria up on the top that will die to protect the ones at the bottom that they're just impossible to get rid of. You can scrape some of those top layers and the bottom ones will immediately start rebuilding. 
Now, this happens inside your sink, but it also happens inside your body. It's estimated that about 80% of bacterial infections are associated with biofilms, and they're so hard to get rid of. So what do we do? Well, that's kind of why my projects all focus on this step here. Because we think if we interfere with this step, if we basically convince them not to stay there in the first place, then you'll never have a problem with a biofilm because it will never form. And how do we do that? Well, I think I have about three months of thesis work left to do, so hopefully by the end of that, I'll be able to let you know. Thank you. <laughs> Your applause, Maria Fund. Thank you so much. Whew. Take a deep breath and relax. Your applause. And now it's uh, and jetzt wieder ihr die letzte Gruppenarbeitsphase noch mal so richtig genießen bitte.